we are going to talk about the things that you need to know for units one and two. We're going to cover the topics of motion, fields, electricity, generation, and other tips for succeeding in year 12 and unit three for physics. We will have a 15 minute break for Q and A. I will actually make it, we will have several five minute breaks throughout the lecture as well, because I might need to get some water and you guys might need to get up and stretch your legs a bit. So it's, um, so you can feel a bit more comfortable, I guess. We're not going to sit in one place for two and a half hours. It can get a bit tiring, but we'll see how we'll go. Again, today's goal is a brief overview of some of the topics encountered in Unit 3. We don't have time to go through them in detail, but that's all right. The whole point is to get a head start. There are some, some things you do need to know from Units 1 and 2. Some of these things are the general guide to answering questions. I'm going to cover it right now, don't worry, but there is a specific way that Vika wants you to answer questions, especially theory questions. We are going to cover Newton's three laws, or that's something that you should know from year 11, if not earlier. We're going to talk about constant acceleration formulas, how to do vector addition, momentum and impulse, the concept of work, gravitational spring and kinetic energy as well. And keep in mind there might be memes <laughs> in this uh, slide deck, so yeah. Uh, this is essentially referring to Newton's third law, but we're going to cover that. We're going to cover that shortly. So let's, uh, let's review a bit how we answer questions in physics. You always write the formula you're using as it is, right? So in the physics exam at the end of this year, you're going to get a formula sheet, right? And this formula sh sheet will contain formulas that Vika has provided to you to answer some of the questions. I would highly recommend you just take those, take the formula from the formula sheet and just uh, copy paste it onto your exam and then sub in the values because this can be a two mark question, right? So the working out here can be worth two marks. One mark for the correct substitution and using the right formula and the second mark for getting the right answer. The reason they do that is because some students might be using the right formula and do the correct substitution, but they might, might get the incorrect answer because uh, they've done something wrong with the calculator or their calculator messed up. That's why it's really, really, really important for you to do the correct substitution, if that makes any sense. It's really important to use the exact formula that Vika has given you, because what will happen is that the examiners will have a solution sheet right next to them, and the solution sheet shows this exact formula, and then the substituted values. So they can compare and contrast, and they can mark your paper, if that makes any sense. But if you use the derived formula, uh, examiners don't have enough time to double check how you derive the formula, if it is a correct derivation. It's just a waste of time from their perspective, so if you're using a derived formula, you will not get any marks, unless your final answer is correct, right? So the whole point, what I'm trying to say is, the whole point of using these formulas is to... It's to make yourself feel a bit more secure because it allows you to gain partial marks, right? So it's pretty cool. Now, that is in regards to mathematical questions, right? Uh, but some questions might be a bit more on the theory end. They might be a bit more theoretical. And 
how do we deal with those, right? In order to answer theory questions, you do really need to tackle three main points. You need to explain the theory related to the question. You need to put the theory in context and you need to make a final statement. For example, uh, you guys haven't covered field yet. Uh, you haven't covered field yet, but the topic of fields is something we will actually cover very soon together. It's something that you will go, uh, you, you will just dive deeper into it during, during the year. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about now, it's kind of an example of you might, what you might expect to see on the final exam. Actually, the question that you see here, both of these uh, are related to past BK exam. Both of them are related to a past VK exam. So, on the figure on the top right hand side, you are going to see a magnet with the northern pole and the south pole and a loop. So explain, the question is as follows. Explain why an electromagnetic force is generated in the wire loop as the magnet approaches the loop. Again, explain why an EMF or electromagnetic force is generated in the wire loop as the magnet approaches the loop. So explain why there is a voltage, that's what EMF is. And the answer will contain three main points. As we said, you need to explain the theory related to the question first. That is, Faraday's law states that if there is a change in magnetic flux, EMF or voltage will be generated as the equation of the equation of voltage is negative n multiplied by change in flux over change in time, which is essentially a derivative of a flux time graph multiplied by the number of coils in a particular, the number of loops in a particular coil. If you feel confused about what I'm talking about, um, don't worry, <laughs> you're gonna learn this throughout the year, so it's gonna be all good. This is just to put in, uh, this is just an example of how to answer theory questions, right? So don't, don't stress out too much. It, it was taken from a VK exam. So yeah, should be a good enough of an example. Now, the second point is that you need to put the theory into context. For example, as flux is equal to B multiplied by A, where B is the magnetic field strength and A is the area of the loop. If the magnetic field strength changes, the flux will also change. And now you make the final statement. Hence, as the magnet gets closer to the loop, the magnetic field strength increases, changing the flux and generating an electromagnetic force. So that's the first thing that I wanted to cover, how to answer questions correctly, right? Uh, there is a VCE is essentially like a game. You need to play by the rules of the game to win, right? Or you need to know the rules of the game and try and use them to your advantage so you can win. A lot of my students have done very well. I would say a lot of them have done very well. I've had students get above a 40 or a 45. It's just because there are a lot of tips and strategies that I personally help them with because obviously I went through the system and I played the games. I played the game according to what I thought was the best way to play it. And I essentially give the same strategies to my students. Obviously, this is not all, right? Like, I could go on for like a couple of hours, if not more, when it comes to strategies. Uh, that's with my private students, that's what I do before the exam or throughout the year. Because, uh, VC, it's basically, it is basically a game to a certain degree, right? And when I'm talking about the game, I mean the game of getting as much of a high ADAR as possible, if that's, 
if that's what you're after. Uh, yeah, that was essentially the game for me. And there's genuinely a pattern to it. Uh, honestly, most of the high achievers, anyone who gets above a 99 ADAR, I can guarantee you, you've, we've done all the same thing, right? We follow the same strategy, all of us, without it, with barely some exceptions. But most of us have followed the exact same strategy. And it's funny because even the subjects we choose are actually pretty similar. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I find it, I find it a bit entertaining. Uh, because it's different minds doing the same thing, I guess. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, it's a thousand students that get, I think, a 99 and above. And I think something like that, or 800 out of 60,000 or so. And if not more. And it's, yeah. Should be out of 100,000 though. Because it's percentile. Yeah. But it's silly. It's very interesting. Um, anyways, going a bit like that's all for strategies for today. If you want to know more, just yeah, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you know how you can get to know more strategies or if you want to hear from, from my personal experiences. Uh, on the topic of which, if you have any questions, right? Just go to Slido and there's an audience Q&A. I will cover both of those questions. Those are both of them really good questions. I will cover them. Phenomenal questions. I will answer those questions as well. I wanted to say you can uh, you can ask right now you can ask a lot of questions right so during the break time we can go through all of them if that makes any sense so ask them whatever question comes up to your to your mind right now just ask them here so that during Q and A I can just cover them if that makes any sense and you don't forget to ask anything for example. I remember on my uh, unit three class, right, uh, on my unit one, when I was teaching physics units one and two, when I did the Head Start lecture, I mentioned that I, I am personally a commerce student at the University of Melbourne. And I said that I actually started, started studying science, then switched to commerce. And a lot of students started asking me, why did you switch degrees, right? I think that's a really cool question to ask because a lot of people don't really think it through what degree they want to do. Personally, I was like that. I was just gunning it for the highest possible ADAR that I could get. And then obviously what I got got me into, if, could get me into every single course I wanted, basically most of them at least, right? So yeah. Something like that. Uh, you, so you free, feel free to ask questions so you don't forget, right? Just put them on the Q&A. You can do it anonymously, so it doesn't matter. All right, so let's get started with talking about Newton's three laws of motion. You should know all three of them by heart by now. The first one is that an object will remain at rest or travel with a constant velocity if the net force acting on the object is zero. The second one is essentially stating that there is an inverse relationship between acceleration and mass. And the third law is stating that if an object A exerts a force on object B, then object B will exert an equal and opposite force on ob object A. Note that these forces act on different objects, right? So this is referring to action-reaction force pairs. We will cover that as well. Don't worry, a lot of my students who did very well, a lot of them were really bad at physics initially. Uh, they couldn't get one question right and then they ended up with a 40 plus study score. So it's pretty cool. You guys are gonna be fine. Trust me when I say this. I'm not just saying it to make you guys feel better about yourself. I'm genuinely saying it because physics, because I know physics is the kind of subject that anyone can do very well in. Anyone without exception. If they put in the right work. Because it's not about only working hard. It's about being smart in the way you work. I'll put a 
I'll plug in my laptop before. Before it runs out of battery. Damn, today is, um, it seems like a rainy day, at least in my area. All right, so let's talk about motion a bit. Let's get in, more into it. These formulas are not, uh, uh, sorry, these formulas are on the end of the year formula sheet. So you don't really need to have them on your cheat sheet. And obviously there are a lot of things that you can or cannot have on your cheat sheet. I have a lot of tips for that as well. But yeah, if we have time, I can cover those tips. So with these formulas, these formulas are for constant acceleration, where S stands for, stands for displacement and it's measured in meters. U is referring to initial velocity. V is referring to final velocity. A is referring to acceleration and T is referring to time. So here, what I would say is, what I would say you need to do is that you need to, it's really important. These constant acceleration formulas are really important, uh, especially uh, for projectile motion. But you guys need to understand something. When acceleration is equal to zero, right? The only formula that you need to use is essentially v is equal to x divided by change in time whereas when acceleration is equal to a particular value and it's a constant you can use any of the formulas that you saw there primarily you can use v is equal to u plus at you can use v square is equal to u square plus 2ax out of those five these are the most common and ut plus 80 square on two right now, if we're together, I can cover again these concepts in more. If you were to have tutoring with me, private tutoring with me, particularly, I'm definitely not going to cover um, this here uh, in this lecture. Obviously, I'm going to cover, I'm going to give you guys some tips about the cheat, cheat sheet and everything. I mean, we do have a separate subsection for this lecture for tips and stuff. But for the more in-depth kind of thing, for example, if a displacement time graph looks like an exponential graph, then the velocity time graph is linear, and then the acceleration time graph is going to be a constant, right? And how they relate to these formulas, and so on and so forth, and then how to essentially use that to your advantage on an exam, and how those interrelate between concepts. I genuinely don't have enough time to cover it in this lecture. I would love to. But if you need to know more about that, if you're very curious, uh, you can contact David and uh, he will essentially either book a session with me or with another tutor. You can just try it out uh, and you can ask them about this. Most of us, as I said, we've gotten very, very decent scores overall. So most of us know, as I said, we all have followed the same strategies and we all we all know the same shortcuts, if that makes any sense. So yeah, I highly recommend paying attention basically. <laughs> yep, so that's about it when it comes to acceleration. So let's get more into projectile motion. And I love projectile motion, I genuinely do. It's, I think, cool because it relates, it, uh, it's multiple concepts basically that can be tested at the same time. With projectile motion, they can test you about Newton's laws, they can test you about momentum, they can test you about impulse, they can test you obviously about motion, constant acceleration formulas, and without any acceleration uh, formulas, it's, 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 pre it's a pretty good uh, topic to essentially tackle many concepts and theories. And this is why projectile motion questions have a lot of marks. They carry a lot of marks on the final VCE exam, a lot. When I mean a lot, I mean a lot. 
uh, this can make the difference between making getting you into the 40s and below 40s. Projectile motion is the reason for that is because projectile motion is looking at a motion in 2D in two dimensions. And remember that velocity is also a vector, right? And it can be split into its components due to its vector addition nature. So there are two components that can be treated individually, a horizontal component of velocity and a vertical component of velocity. They can be found from using uh, trigonometry. And, and another important note is that the only force acting on this object in the projectile is gravity. So let me cover this again. Let me repeat it again, but let me simplify it a bit. What is a projectile to begin with? A projectile is essentially when we shoot something in a particular trajectory, right? When something is launched in a particular trajectory, for example, a rocket, right? Now, obviously, what will happen is that when you throw a ball, not a rocket, let's say a ball, when you kick a ball and it's going to follow a particular trajectory, the only force that is acting on the ball throughout this in its entire path, throughout, it, throughout the entire time it is in air, the only force acting on the object, on the ball, is going to be the weight force. Obviously, there is also air resistance that comes into play, but don't forget, the Vika study design says that you only need to understand or you only need to give a qualitative response in terms of the effect of air resistance on the projectile, right? So no quantitative nature associated to it. But let's focus on the other components before we go to air resistance and discussing about that. So what are the components of a projectile? We said that the only force acting on it is going to be the weight force. What else? Well, the projectile looks like an inverse parabola, all right? And we know that another component of the projectile is going to be its height and its range, because as we said, it's 2D, right? It has both a height and width. Now. This is really crucial, all right, and we're going to come back to it later for the height and the range of the project, all right? This is what we call the range is the distance from point A to point B, and height is essentially how high above the ground, if this is the ground level, does the projectile go. Now, the object will have obviously only a force acting downwards on it, but it will have a velocity, and the velocity will be at a particular angle. Now, if you do remember from year 11 physics, we have talked about scalars and uh, vectors. Scalars are variables that only have a magnitude, for example, distance or time. Whereas vectors, they have both a magnitude and a direction, for example, displacement or velocity. Speed is a scalar because speed is equal to change in distance right change in distance over change in time that is what speed is velocity however it's defined in terms of displacement so because displacement is a vector velocity is also a vector but what is displacement what is the difference between displacement and velocity and the reason we need to know that is because acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time and that is why acceleration is a vector, because velocity is a vector. But velocity is a vector because displacement is a vector. But what is the difference between displacement and distance? And the difference is very simple. Let's take an example to understand this. Let's say there is a frog at the bottom of the wall, and the wall if, is 5 meters. This frog will try and climb over the wall. It will try and go to the top, once but then it will slip back down and it will try and climb it up climb it up again the distance that the frog has covered is actually 15 meters because the frog has gone up down up right five meters up five meters down and then five meters up again so that's 10 15 right five 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 however the displacement of the frog is only five meters right because from point g to point h right the displacement of the frog is only 5 meters. The height of the wall is 5 meters, right? So that is kind of the difference between a scalar and a vector. Now, vectors can be decomposed into their horizontal and vertical component. And why is that important? That is important because the projectile has a velocity and the projectile in itself, by definition, is... Uh, 
a 2D motion. It has both a horizontal and vertical component, which means the velocity of the projectile can be decomposed into a horizontal and vertical component. <clears throat> and we can use trigonometry to find out the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity. And that is what helps us use constant acceleration formulas and determine the final velocity of the projectile, the final range, the time, or anything else that is required for us to know by the question that the examiners are going to ask. So this is how a projectile looks like, basically. So it kind of travels in that inverse parabolic shape. And don't forget, there is also a range. Don't forget that because there is only a vertical acceleration, right? Acceleration due to the weight force, due to gravity. And there is no horizontal force being applied to the ball. Uh, there will only be vertical acceleration, no horizontal acceleration, which means velocity is constant in the horizontal plane, right? Because V is equal to U plus AT. If a is equal to zero, v is equal to u, so v is equal to v, so it's a constant. However, for the vertical component of velocity, right, you have to use the SUVAT formulas. The key points to remember about projectile motion is that when a projectile is in the air under the influence of gravity, the only force acting on the projectile is gravity. The horizontal and vertical forces are independent of each other. The horizontal velocity is constant and the vertical velocity changes due to gravity, but the acceleration is constant. Hence, any of the constant acceleration formula are applicable. Does that make sense, guys? I think it's pretty straightforward. Now we're going to go and talk about forces a bit. Just give me one second. I need to drink some water. And after we cover forces, before we go into fields, we're going to do some questions because I am a big fan of practice. Practice, practice, practice. We are doing well with time. Cool, so let's keep going. Remember that forces are vectors and vectors can be added. When dealing with forces, we can use a lot of vector addition and Newton's second law. So let's review a bit of vector addition. So this is horizontal component. So vector addition is essentially something like this. So if you have uh, we use the head to tail method for vector addition if you guys don't remember. 
So the head to tail method essentially involves, let's say you have something going like that, like that. The head to tail method involves that. The force that is acting here should be something like this, the net force. I think it's pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. Now, when reviewing forces and inclined planes, we need to state that two forces act on an object on an inclined plane excluding friction. There is the weight force, the normal force, and these forces give an act force that acts downwards. These forces can be rearranged to make a triangle to find out other information about the object using trigonometry. However, please guys, do not confuse, and this is another mistake, and this is one of the things that I do uh, talk to my students pretty often. It's the silly mistakes that a lot of people make or how they get confused on the exam, right? Inclined planes are not the same thing as banked tracks. The way you draw the forces on an inclined plane versus the way you draw the forces on a banked track are different. There is a difference between inclined planes and banked tracks. However, Vika obviously knows that a lot of students don't know the difference and most of the time students trip up and make a mistake. So they will keep asking and asking this again. On an inclined plane, the force is acting downwards. On a banked track, which is again increased at a height in order to achieve the design speed of an object, right? The net force acts towards the center of the path. If we have time, I'll cover a bit more of that as well. During the tips. If not, uh, yeah. It probably means that we've run out of time. However, at the moment, everything uh, we seem to be doing very well with time, so let's keep going. Let's talk about tension a bit. Tension is the force in a rope or object that is created when something pulls on it. Many people struggle with tension questions and in fact it's one of the worstly assessed topics. Uh, it's one of the worstly done or... And, okay, the topic about tension, the questions in, reg in regards to tension are uh, horribly answered by students and Vika keeps asking those questions. Here are some tips to tackle tension type of questions. You always need to draw a force diagram. You need to find the acceleration of the entire system and look at the system as a whole. And once you have the acceleration, use Newton's second law to find the tension. Look at, an e at every individual component. This works for most of the time, so if you're stuck, give it a go, and also be very careful with signs and directions. Now, some tension questions, some of you might be asking, what are types of tension questions? Some of them, again, one of the mostly incorrectly asked questions on the exam, which is very simple. It's this question here. Connected bodies. Usually it's also spring kind of questions. Connected bodies is really awfully answered. Uh, as I told you guys, I've done this for a while. Uh, so, Right, it's towing something. Again, these are the two main ways Vika asks or tests the topic of tension. And then the third way is by using springs. These are the three main, that's like the pattern that Vika follows to test, to test the, your knowledge of tension. But yeah.
that's what you need to be careful of. Remember, you can use this as a connected body. Uh, the total force, uh, you can say, for example, to find acceleration here is the weight force acting on the object here, divided by total mass of the system, so mass 1 plus mass 2, that's the acceleration of both of them. And in order to find tension, you multiply mass here, so if this is m1 and this is m2, tension would be m2 multiplied by a, which you found here, right? So it's, it's very straightforward, very simple. Um, yeah. Or, I have plenty of formulas that just in case you get stuck, you can find it easily. Right, this is one of the formulas, same thing. That's how you find... This is how you find acceleration, M1G divided by M1 plus M2, and tension is going to be equal to... Same thing, but it's going to be M2, uh, M2, M1 plus M2G divided by M1 plus M2. It looks like a bit of nonsense here because I, yeah, it's a bit overcrowded, but you guys get the point. So there are plenty of formulas to uh, double check what you're doing. And yeah, some things you can have on your cheat sheet that can help you uh, double check your working out essentially because they are very quick. It's a very quick method to get um, To test whether you have the correct Working out or not. So let's talk about Let's talk about uh, Motion and specifically let's talk about energy There are three different types of energy. There is gravitational potential energy. There is kinetic energy and there is spring energy All right Gravitational potential energy is calculated by using mass multiplied by g multiplied by h. Kinetic energy is half mv square and spring energy is half k dot ix squared. The variables are mass in kilograms, gravitational, gravitational field strength, uh, height, velocity, spring constant, and extension. Now, there is a law of conservation of energy which states that for any isolated system only, and this works only for isolated systems, the total amount of energy is conserved, but it can be, uh, is conserved, which means it can be transferred from one form into another, right? This is why you see the mean of Batman slapping the Joker, right? Like, let me transfer some energy into you because energy has to be transferred. It cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form onto another. Now, work is defined as a change in energy. Usually, it is also the, for the area of a force displacement graph. Work is measured in joules, force is measured in newtons, and displacement is measured in meters. The only time it will be the area under a force distance graph is if you have the distance in the right units. That's how you're going to get work. Otherwise, it's, it might be off by a decimal place. So, one or two decimal places. So, be careful to see. Again, that's one of my top tips. This is where students also, not one of my top tips, but a uh, common tip is that uh, students mistakenly when Vika for example asks calculate the calcul find the work that is done by the object and it gives you a graph students immediately calculate the area of the graph which is a good thing to do because that's what work is it is changing energy or force multiplied by distance however it is the area under force distance graph where force is defined as in newtons and the units of measurement of distance are in meters distance or displacement they are in meters not centimeters but meters Right? Be very careful there. Another thing is that a lot of students don't understand. This is another, like, one of the strategies or one of the things that students are unaware of, even though it's implied on the Vika study design that you should know, is that work is equal to fx cos theta. Right? It's not just f multiplied by x because if, let's say, you're pushing a trolley, right, and it's being pushed at a particular angle, work and let's say you push the trolley for five meters right with five newtons of force 
but the angle is 30 degrees, obviously the amount of work that you are applying is not 5 by 5 it's not 25 joules, right? It doesn't make any sense because some of this force is being used to push the trolley horizontally, right? Let's break down the force there. Some of it is going towards horizontal motion, which is the motion that we care about. Some of it is going down, right? But the force, when we apply force downwards on the trolley, obviously the normal force will act upwards from the ground and then they will cancel each other out. So the only component of the force that is used, that is used to do work, is the horizontal component. And how do we find that? We find that by multiplying it by cos of theta, by using trigonometry. And that is how you find the work that is being done in this case. So again, two things where students trip up. One, calculating the area of a force distance graph will not always give you the work because you have to have the unit in the you have to have the correct units second of all you need to be careful again to decompose the force and then calculate the work right you need to be careful because Fika will try and trip you guys up that's that's kind of the name of the game right it's seeing which student is the most attentive to the theory right who understands the theory well and they will try and throw you off like that even though it seems pretty straightforward, like calculating the area of the graph or just f multiplied by x, it's actually not. One of the worst done topics on the exam, however, is springs, not just work and forces, it is springs. Springs are absolutely, horribly, um, yeah, it's a horribly done topic on the exam, springs. I don't have any words. Throughout the years, throughout the decade, the last decade, if you go through all the exams in the last decade, and trust me, I have, I have even more than the last decade, actually, I've done up until 1995. Obviously, I, I graduated in 2019, right? So, pretty recent. My graduation is very recent. I'm, I'm not, the age difference between me and you guys, trust me, is not that much. Once you get into uni, you'll realize we're basically, <laughs> uh, we're basically, uh, the same <laughs> but yeah I've done up until 2000 like from 2000 onwards I've done all those physics exams I can guarantee you uh, springs have always been a very well, students perform very poorly when it comes to springs the reason is because people don't understand Hooke's law that very well that's one of the reasons and they are not very comfortable with the topic of energy. And springs kind of encapsulates, encapsulates both Hooke's law and the topic of energy, right? And first of all, let's focus on Hooke's law. So Hooke's law says that for, let's say we have a particular spring, right? And which we are pressing to the right. Let's say we use a block to press this spring to the right. Cool. Let's say we press the spring, all right, with a block. The amount of force that we are applying, right, so it's, it's proportional to the distance that the spring will be compressed by. Does that make any sense, guys? The amount of force that we will be applying will be proportional or the compression of the spring will be proportional to the amount of force that we are applying. And that should make sense, right? The more we apply, the more force we apply on the spring, the more it will compress, right? The more force we apply on the spring, the more it will compress. However, this force that you see here is not the force that we are applying on the spring. That is not what Hooke's law represents. Hooke's law represents the force that the spring is also applying on us. 
Right, remember Newton's third law? So springs are poorly, students don't do well in springs because springs involve, they involve Hooke's law, they involve conservation of energy and Newton's third law, right? So it's three different concepts tied up in one place, right? That's what the negative is there for. And trust me, you need to know why the negative is there, even though it's not part of the study design or it's briefly mentioned. It was part of my exam, so I'm telling you, I do remember very well my physics exam. I remember that one very well. Um, you do need to know why the negative is there, 100 million percent. And that is the force that the spring is applying on us, not the force that we apply on the spring. The negative represents that there is an action-reaction force per interaction at the spring. That is, the more force we apply on the spring, the more force the spring will, will apply back on us. And the compression of the spring is proportional to the force that we apply on the spring or proportional to the force that the spring applies on us. Because remember, they are one and the same in terms of magnitude. Right? Action, reaction, force pairs. What else? Now, Hooke's law, as you can see, is a linear graph, right? With a constant gradient. I mean, that's the definition of a linear graph. The area here, this is a force distance graph, force extension graph in meters. So what the area represents, it represents work that we've done on the spring. But at the same time, what is work? Work is change in energy. In this case, it's change in elastic potential energy. And don't forget, we have three different types of energy. Gravitational potential energy, which is MGH. We have elastic potential. We have, yeah, kinetic energy, which is half mv square. And elastic potential energy, which is equal to half k delta x squared. Now, some of you might be answering, we know that this represents energy. We understand that the area on the force distance graph with the correct unit represents energy. But what is k, right? k that you see here and that you also see on Hooke's law, k represents the stiffness on, of the spring, right? The higher the value of k, the stiffer the spring is. And you also need to know what k is in terms of words, right? A lot of students have very poorly performed on the exam. I would say like 3%, 4% got that question right. Now, there's also something else which is called oscillating springs. When we are talking about oscillating springs, we are talking about springs that start at the top, go down midway through, and then up to the bottom, and then start going back up. Right? They go up and down. In this case, all three forms of energy are present. You have gravitational potential energy at the top, which is then converted into uh, kinetic energy and elastic potential energy. And then at the bottom, you only have elastic potential energy. This is what this means, top, middle, and at the bottom, right? At the top, the gravitational potential energy is a maximum. But kinetic energy and elastic potential energy is equal to zero if the spring is at, the, at its resting length. Midway through, the kinetic energy is the maximum. The graph will look something like that for kinetic energy. But the gravitational potential energy is half of what it was before. And elastic potential energy, ah, it's going somewhere. We don't really know the value, right? At the bottom, both gravitational potential energy is equal to zero and kinetic energy is equal to zero because the spring is resting at the bottom. But... Elastic potential energy is the maximum. Are you, going, are you guys all cool with what I mentioned here? Now, some of you might have noticed the force section here. You should remember that the force that is being applied by gravity is always constant, it's the same, it's the same throughout the oscillation of the spring. But, the force applied by the spring can vary. At the top is equal to zero, then midway through it equals the force by the gravity, then at the bottom is a maximum, right? The more you pull the spring down, the more it will try and pull you up.
and these are the graphs. You do need to know these graphs. The reason why the gravitational potential energy is going straight down is because it's a linear graph, again MGH. Elastic potential energy is going up exponentially, don't remember it's half k delta x squared. And half mv squared, elastic potential energy, again half mv squared, v squared, uh, they are both parabolic graphs, right? We have here the fact that gravitational potential energy is the weight, uh, sorry, the orange force is the weight force, and it's a constant because of g being a constant. You have the force that is being applied by the spring, which increases the more you pull the spring downwards, and the net force is subtracting the yellow line from the green line, and then you will get the net force. And as you can see, it's actually equal to zero midway through. And this is crucial because this is where a lot of students back in the 2018 or 17 exam, I'm not sure, it was on my exam, but I remember doing it as a practice exam for myself, and I saw like only 2% or 1% of the state got that correctly, right? So some stuff, it can get pretty crazy at times with Vika. Right, uh, give me one second, guys. I'll keep explaining the rest. We have momentum and a bit more left. Before we go on to break. Because we're going to talk about circular motion as well. So. All right. Now for momentum, momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity, where P is momentum, which is measured in kilograms meters per second. M is mass in kilograms. V is velocity in meters per second. Now momentum can loosely be thought of how hard it is to make an object stop. We never write this down on the VK exam, but this is how we think of momentum. There's also the law of conservation of momentum, which states that momentum in a collision is always conserved. Now, there's also something called impulse. Impulse is the measure of the change in momentum of an object when a force acts on it. Impulse is m multiplied by delta v or force multiplied by change in time. I is impulse acting on an object, m is the mass of the object, and delta v is the change in velocity in meters per second. F is the force in newtons, and delta t is how long the collision lasts in seconds. Now, due to the law of conservation of momentum, the magnitude of the impulse acting on the object is equal to the magnitude of the impulse acting on the other object in a collision. The only difference is that they act in opposite directions.
Now, something cool to take note about this equation, first of all, is the top one. You can have it on your cheat sheet. Uh, and I can derive it even more if you guys like, would like me to, right? So mass multiplied by V. So do you guys see this part here? There are a lot of derivation and stuff that a lot of students miss out on. What's this? Changing velocity over changing time? Mass multiplied by acceleration. So it was right in front of you all of this time. Right? So I think it's pretty cool. This is why I like impulse and momentum. It makes sense. Now, again, something to note here is that if you catch an egg, again, an impulse on the egg uh, will make it stop. For any given mass and change in velocity, the impulse is constant. If you increase the time of the collision, the force acting on the egg decreases, making it, making it less likely to break. And this can be done by moving your hands uh, when you catch your when you catch the egg. Now, obviously, this is not the most important part of impulse. Uh, the most important important part of impulse that is going to be tested on your exam. It was tested on my exam actually, and it was describing crumple zones in cars. When it comes to describing crumple zones in cars, right, uh, cars have some parts that can be very easily crushed. The reason for that is because we said that force is equal to impulse divided by change in time, right? Basically, the more you increase the time of the collision for the same amount of impulse, right? Because the car will come to stop if it collides with something, right? The more you will reduce the force that is being apl applied on the car and therefore on the driver. Now that is why we also have a seat belt. That is why you also get like a kind of airbag that pops out. So it cushions your, um, it cushions the collision, basically, right? Cool. And since we're talking about collisions, um, there is something called elastic and inelastic collisions. Now, keep in mind, when we are talking about momentum, usually the most common scenario, they will give you two objects going one, going left, one, going right initially. And then afterwards, they will say that they're going to collide both together. They're going to be joined or separated and they're moving off to the right, for example. And then you have to calculate the momentum before and after, velocity before and after or for each of the objects. And then the final question, right? So it's kind of A, B, C kind of question, right? It's a multiple part question. The final component of the question, right, part C will ask you whether the collision is elastic or inelastic. And it has a lot of marks. Students here, they lose a lot of the marks because they don't really attempt this question properly. They do not give the full working out. The first thing that you need to do is you need to calculate in order to find out whether the collision is elastic or inelastic. You need to find out whether the total kinetic energy of the system before the collision is equal to or not to the kinetic energy of the system after the collision, but of the system, which means kinetic energy of block one and kinetic energy of block two before the collision, that will make up kinetic energy of the system before the collision. And you need to compare this kinetic energy to the kinetic energy of the system after the collision, right? But this in means the kinetic energy of block one after it collided and kinetic energy of block two after it collided added up together. Then you compare them, right? So it can be a four mark question. One mark for calculating the kinetic energy before and after. One mark calculating the kinetic energy before and after. The third mark for stating whether they're equal or not for making these 
for comparing the two and the fourth mark for actually stating whether the collision is elastic or inelastic. So even just showing that the two kinetic energies are equal to one another at the end is not enough for you to get marks, full marks. You have to say that having equal kinetic energies before and after the collision for the two systems means that the collision is elastic. Does that make any sense guys? So you have to be a bit more thorough and you're working out. This is what they mean when they say you need to have detailed working out. That's why. All right. We have circular motion and then we go into a break. Trust me, it's going to be a decent break, so 10 minutes, I would say, and then 5 minutes, we can go to uh, another 10 minutes, we can go to q &A or something. Yeah, 5 to 7 minutes break, and then seven, another 7 minutes Q&A should be good, that's like 14 minutes, 14, 15 minutes, should be alright. And I haven't uh, finished asking you guys all those questions, so yeah. Again, hang on with me, five more slides. Now, when it comes to circular, circular motion, it is not as tricky as some people think, you just need to know the formula, right? This is the formula for acceleration. And this is the formula for centripetal force. Now. There are three different types of circular motion. There is horizontal motion, vertical motion, and banked tracks. The properties of circular motion are essentially centripetal acceleration and centripetal force, where centripetal acceleration refers to the acceleration which is towards the center of the circle, and centri centripetal force refers to the net force acting on the object that is towards the center. And the velocity is tangential to the circular path, right? And T is the period of the object, referring to how long it takes for the object to make one full revolution. So T is the period that it takes for an object to make a full revolution, acceleration is towards the center, velocity is tangential to the circular path, that is, if this object would to stop going in circles, it would just go off in a straight line. And Another thing that you need to know is how to draw this graph. Vika always asks drawing this graph. Again, you have to draw velocity line perpendicular at a 90 degrees angle to the circular path and you need to draw acceleration as an arrow, solid arrow towards the center and probably a centripetal force arrow towards the center but usually with a dotted line. This is circular motion in a horizontal plane. Essentially, it's trying to say here that the centripetal part of the motion comes from the friction, right? Because centripetal force is just a friction force, right? Centripetal force is not a, it's not a new made up kind of force. It's not a force on its own. It's a combination of forces. Centripetal force is a net force. There's also uh, a vertical circular motion where objects are going around in circles. But up and down. In this case, you will never be asked what happens in these two parts of the circle, if the circle is vertical, right? But you will be asked what happens at the top and at the bottom of the circle, right? Because here we will try and, and explore three other new concepts. The concept of apparent weightlessness, true weightlessness, and apparent weight, apparent weightlessness, and true weightlessness, right? So there are three different concepts that you need to study there. But all that you need to understand is that at the bottom of the circle, the normal force will be greater than the weight force, and at the top of the circle, the weight force will be greater than the normal force, and the object will keep going in circles anyways. The main thing about apparent weight and apparent weightlessness that you see here what you need to understand is that the normal force is our perception of weight, 
right the greater the normal force the heavier we feel right for example when an elevator is pulling us up the normal force coming from the elevator is greater than our own weight force so we should feel lighter for a bit or at least back in the day now these elevators are really decent at maintaining a zero net force but back in the days that's how it used to be right so your perception of weight or how heavy you are how you feel how heavy you are depends on the normal force that is coming from the ground upwards but if the normal force is less than the weight force like in this example you're gonna feel lighter right at the top of the circle so if you were in this car you would feel lighter even though the normal force is less than the weight force apparent weightlessness occurs therefore when the normal force is equal to zero so let's say at the top here let's say the this car is climbing up the hill and at the top it loses contact with the ground when it loses contact with the ground there is no normal force it's equal to zero therefore apparent weightlessness is equal to zero true weightlessness however it's not like apparent weightlessness, it's not apparent, it's not what we feel, it's true, it's the actual, it's the factual weight. The factual weight, our own factual weight, is equal to mg, right? And it can only be equal to zero if the mass is equal to zero, or if acceleration due to gravity is equal to zero. And this can only occur in deep space. Now, obviously, this is banked tracks, which is different from inclined planes, right? This is another form of circular motion, and here is where we talk about the design speed, which is basically the speed that an object travels at, so that the friction is not needed to keep it on the track. The only formula that you need to know is this, and you will ask to find the design speed by rearranging the formula, and you will also ask by Vika to draw a graph, right? To draw the arrows where the normal force has to be perpendicular with the plane the centripetal force has to go towards the center of the circle and the weight force straight down from the center of the object's body if that makes any sense right these are like the small things that students forget that they don't know but these matter right like you can lose marks this is how vika creates a distribution because technically speaking the physics exam is not the hardest right it's pretty straightforward it's just the tips and tricks that people need to know to do well now let's look at the question as i said i love questions i love practice questions practice makes perfect let's have a go at this question for two to three minutes. Julia has a mass of 60 kilograms and is an absolute adrenaline junkie. She loves going to amusement parks. Her particular favorite is the Ferris wheel. She gets on the Ferris wheel with a radius of five meters and times the period to be 30 seconds. What is the normal force acting on Julia at the top of the Ferris wheel? Can you guys calculate it? The normal force acting on Julia at the top of the Ferris wheel. Give it five minutes. I'll give you guys five minutes. You have the formula here on the side as well, the centripetal formula, the centripetal force. I will draw a graph, I will explain it as well as I can. On the meanwhile, I'm going to get some water while you guys tackle this question. I'll give you five minutes because a lot of students, this is, don't worry if you don't get it right. A lot of people haven't gotten this question right in the past, a lot. It's not supposed to be easy.
It's quite cold today, isn't it? Right? So, who has five minutes? Uh, oh, I'll attempt it. I'll, I'll explain it anyways. So let's go. Um, so she's at the top of the first one. The radius is five meters, right? What is the normal force on Julia at the top? There is a normal force that goes upwards. There is a normal force that goes weight force that goes down, and there is a net force, right? Alright, so let's say the, the Julius is on this car, you have a normal force going up, you have a weight force going down, and the weight force should be a bit larger than the normal force, and then you have a net force, which is, again, the centripetal force, right? The centripetal force is not as... it's in between the weight force and the normal force, right? Because the centripetal force, right, so the centripetal force or F net is equal to weight force minus normal force. F net is mv square on R, right, and it's equal to mg minus n. So n is equal to mv square on R plus mg, right? So this is how we find the normal force. The mass is 60 kilograms, you just do the substitution. Multiplied by the velocity by Julia's velocity. Uh, we don't have the velocity here for Julia, so what I'm going to do is instead of using this formula, mv square on r, we're going to use the formula 4 pi square by square mr divided by t square, right? And then you just have to use the same formula here at the bottom and add them up together. One second. Right, four pi square m r divided by t square. I think you guys get the gist of it. No, Jesus. Again, n is equal to 4 pi square m r divided by t square plus m g, right? So it's 4 pi, it's 4 pi square. 4 pi square multiplied by 60 multiplied by the radius, which is 5. Divided by 30 seconds, 30 squared plus uh, 60 multiplied by 9.8. Use 9.8 and then you just sub in the values, add them up, right? Like sub in the values in your calculator and you should get. It. So it's around 7,738, round it up.
and don't forget the value, uh, the units. So let's get on to the topic of fields. We've been here for two hours, we can do half an hour more. Let's go. So what is a field? Well, a field is a 3D region of space, right? And when two fields interact, they apply a force on each other. How can we represent fields? Well, we represent fields using vectors, aka arrows. The shape of the field line shows the shape of the field. The closer the lines are, the stronger the, stronger the field is, and know that the lines can never touch. Now, when we are talking about the gravitational fields, some of the properties that you need to know is that there are going to be three types. Sorry, there are going to be three types of fields I should have mentioned. Gravitational, electric, and magnetic. The properties are that there are only there are only attractive fields. A monopole has a one pole the, for gravitational fields. Uh, the shape is radial. The arrows point inwards, and the field is stronger near the mass. The formulas for gravitational field are g is equal to gm divided by r square, or g multiplied by capital M multiplied by smaller m divided by r square. Now I'm going to explain what all of them explain what all of them mean. You have them on the bottom right hand side as well. Okay, talking for two hours is not the best idea. So, let's take an example. Let's assume you are, let's, there's a satellite, and let's assume this is Earth, and we have a satellite, let's say the Moon, alright? G represents the gravitational constant, universal gravitational constant is 6.67 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative 11. M is the mass of the Earth. R square is the radius. However, 90% of students make a mistake here. Big M is the mass of the Earth, mass of the larger body. Smaller M is mass of the smaller body, the Moon. The radius, this is where students mess up all the time. It's from the center of the Earth to the center of the satellite. Alright? The radius of the Earth is from the center of the Earth to the surface of the Earth. And the altitude, the height that which of which the satellite is above the Earth is called the altitude. Right? So, the radius that you put in as a denominator... The radius there is equal to the radius of the Earth plus the altitude. I can guarantee you about 70% of the state makes a mistake here. There are a lot of mistakes that students make. Again, this is just an overview. Like, this is a head start lecture. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to it, right? But if you can avoid this, you're basically guaranteed onto a high score, right? Like, getting a high score. Because as you've seen so far, physics is pretty simple. Or you can make it even simpler if you do the right questions. And yep, satellite motion. Cool. Uh, when it comes to satellites, there's something called a geostationary satellite. A geostationary satellite is a satellite that has a period equal to the period of the Earth. That is, if it takes 24 hours for Earth to rotate around itself, the satellite also takes 24 hours to rotate around Earth. The reason we call it geostationary is because it's above the same point on Earth all the time. It's above the equator. And the rest about the parent weight and the parent weightlessness we, we cover. 
Here, what you're seeing here is essentially something called Kepler's Law. And I can get into more details about this. There are some tricks that we got. We don't have that much time, but there is a way that we got tricks students. And there are some good questions that you can do on uh, past exams. I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head. I have a list somewhere of some of the questions. But anyways. Um... I do remember uh, they try and treat you with Kepler's law. So Kepler's law essentially is R cube on T square is equal to GM on 4 pi square, right? But there is certain ways that Vika uses this. Uh, the basic ones is you should know this formula and you should know the rearrangement square cube of GM t square on 4 pi square and you should also know the rearrangement of t is equal to square root of um, 4 pi square r cube divided by gm this is like the basics right you should know you should know this uh, it comes from the fact that they are saying since we have the earth and the moon right as a satellite going around the earth this is where Kepler's law came from, right? These are the formulas that you need to have on your cheat sheet for sure because it will come up on the exam. But what I'm going to explain now is where did these formulas kind of came from, right? They came from the fact that we know that the weight force, the formula that you saw before, right? The weight force, we said it's universal gravitational constant multiplied by mass of the Earth, multiplied by mass of the Moon, divided by the radius squared, where the radius is altitude, plus radius of the earth, right? Or just the distance between the centers of the two bodies. Now, this is the weight force. But if the weight force that is acting on the moon by earth and on earth by the moon, right? The weight force now is not just G multiplied by M. This is too basic, right? G is equal to G M on R, right? Right, we are extrapolating, right? We're going a bit deeper into it, what G is. So it's kind of getting deeper and deeper, learning about physics more and more. So far from year 11, you've only scratched the surface of what physics is, right? And you can go deeper into it. Now, this is what weight force is, and this is the weight force that Earth applies on the Moon, and the force that the Moon applies on Earth. But, if you assume that the path that the Moon follows around the Earth, its orbit, it's not elliptical, if you assume it is perfectly circular, right you can see that the weight force now becomes a centripetal force so you can equate the weight force to m v square on r you can cancel out the mass of the moon right and you can come to the conclusion that the gravitational field strength is equal to a centripetal acceleration and then you break it down here you can follow the masses and you're left with you're left with this part which is basically Kepler's law here. Now obviously there are two types of energies associated with a satellite going around Earth. The most obvious one is gravitational potential energy and the other one is kinetic energy. Now keep in mind as a satellite Let's say you shoot a rocket into space and then you, that rocket is coming back, right? Like SpaceX. As the rocket comes back, it's losing gravitational potential energy, but it's gaining kinetic energy. Now, because we have a new formula for gravitational potential energy, right? Because we said gravitational potential energy is mgh, but g is now gm on r squared, because it's a function of distance, you can't use this formula anymore, right? You don't need to know why you can't use it anymore. I'm explaining it for those of you who are mathematically minded. But you can't you can't use it anymore. That's basically it. So you need to use, calculate the area under a graph, and that's it. It's pretty straightforward. Don't forget the units should be correct one. Again, I've told you before, the distance should be in meters and it should be force in newtons. If it's not force, if it's G in newtons per kilogram, you need to multiply it by the mass of the satellite. 
Now let's go on to electric fields. Electric fields are radial just like gravitational fields. The field is stronger towards the point charge. They are monopoles and arrows point away from a positive charge but they point towards the negative charge. There is a formula. Let's say this is the proton and then you have an electron orbiting around the proton. Just like gravitational field strength is equal to gm on r square, the electric field strength is equal to kq multiplied by r square, where q is the charge of the proton. Now, if you multiply it by another q, which is the charge of the electron, if I had more time, I could explain this better, obviously, but if it's the charge of the electron, obviously, you're going to get the electric force applied. Right? Just like if you multiply this by the mass of the moon, by the mass of the satellite, you can get a weight force, right? So I'm drawing two parallels between um, a gravitational fields and electric fields. These parallels are like if the proton, if the nucleus is the Earth, and if the satellite now is the electron instead of the moon, right? It's kind of the same thing. You can see multiple parallels being drawn here. What will be asked by you, by Vika, right? As you can see, again, the formula is very similar to what you saw before. Now, what will be asked you guys, by Vika? Well, one of the main things is to draw arrows correctly. Again, they come out of the proton and they go into the electron. Out of the proton, onto the electron. If you have two like charges, the magnetic fields they will cancel the electric fields they will cancel each other out right so be careful with that and field lines never cross each other now obviously there are external uh, electric fields internal electric fields all of that um, there are other formulas associated with that section for example um, the electric field strength here is not what you saw before there's a new formula it's v divided by d um, force is Q multiplied by E and work is Q multiplied by V. Obviously, I could go into derivation of this in more detail, but the thing is, we don't have that much time and I can summarize it by saying we have radial fields and we have uh, non-radial fields, right? In this case, the field is non-radial, that's why it gets the form that it gets. We could potentially draw a parallel with gravitational field lines as well, with gravitational fields, but we don't have the time. So, let's go on to magnetic fields. Because magnetic fields are very important as well. And I want